touch. <laughs> he wants to see you. Oh, uh, yeah. It's... All right. Stay right there. Uh, should have put, should have put you a little treats right there. Oh yeah. Yeah. Is he show? He'd be showing up. There. Is he showing up on there? Uh. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Oh, there yeah. he goes. Uh, That's a good picture. Uh, Kyler, show I him didn't your know best Kyler side. Could do good pictures. Yeah, show him your best side, bro. <laughs> All right. How, when, how, and, how old is he? <laughs> Kyler is. Oh my goodness, we got enough sound here, don't we? Yeah. Uh, Kyler is, he's going to be almost 10 years old. So in human years, he's up in his 70s. He's uh -huh. like me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd rather go by dog years. I'm, I'm like 10. Uh, okay. How, how did you find him? Uh, Kyler was a dog that we were uh, blessed to get because we had another pit bull and called the uh, direct TV people to come out and Sur survey the backyard to see if we could uh, get direct uh, get direct TV and what they did was after they surveyed they decided not to shut the back gate oh. so his name was uh, uh, Buddy we called him Buddy the dog and he was a beautiful pet oh. and so uh, they did reimburse us some money direct TV did and uh, so we did want another pet because we liked uh, Buddy so much okay. that we found out through a gentleman that worked at the bank uh, that he had some puppies and that they were full bred um, and so we then looked at different dogs I took my daughter-in-law uh, Jen and uh, she picked Kyler out and she picked the name out and so that's how we ended up getting Kyler oh, I see. so he's 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 been a blessing uh, he was at my son's for the longest time but the problem was every time I would go to their house to visit Kyler when I left he would just sit there by the door and he would whine and uh, he, he just really was inactive and didn't do a whole lot of things until I would come back over and visit. So my son dropped the question on me and kind of put it in a way that Kyler's so much happier when you're around. And uh, you don't have a, a dog <laughs> at your place. And I said, son, I know what you're getting at. <laughs> and uh, I said, that's a big responsibility. And I said, besides that, I've got a wonderful grace mate that we have no issues oh, or no problems. Uh, and we just uh, I just don't want anything to come in in uh, in, in 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 our relationship that may cause uh, any division. <laughs> it certainly wouldn't be because Joel doesn't rightly divide or Mike doesn't that we, does, we would have division. But does, does we'd he, have a we would have a dog that does, would cause division. Does he do any tricks? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> he, he, can, no. he can fart like my grandfather. Oh, my goodness. Sure. No, he's real good about that. <laughs> he doesn't pass gas very much. Oh, no. Um, because I, I've noticed, uh, you know, some, sometimes I wake up in the morning and <laughs> lo and behold, <laughs> instead of having a face, uh, uh, a face in my face, <laughs> I've got a butt in my face. And so, uh, thank God, uh, he's pretty good about that. <laughs> And I told him if he's going to pass gas, he needs to go in your room. So uh, and, and greet you not with a holy, yes. not with a holy kiss or a yeah. holy lick, but a yeah. holy, you know what? Uh, so, uh, oh my goodness! Uh, but a lot of people have commented and said, and we've made comments, and you've you've made some comments about Kyler. And I just wanted to clear the air to show what a wonderful dog that he is. He's very loyal. Um, he, he's a grace believer. There's no doubt about it. He, he understands right division. I don't put him on the if then principle. He's under an identity based love system. Rather Is he than, saved? I'm not sure. Uh, if dogs were saved, he would definitely go because God knows he's heard me preach uh, enough. And uh, he'll just stare at, you know, it's like going to somebody, uh, an unsaved person, right? And you're trying to give them the gospel. And it says that the natural man, excuse me, Kyler, it says the natural man, <laughs> the natural man receiveth not the things uh, of, of God. And so, uh, you know, when you talk to them, they, they stare at you. They're like a, on a different wavelength, like where are you coming from and what are you trying to tell me and all that? 
Well, that's how it is with Kyler when I talk to him. He just stares at me and, yeah. you know, I don't know if he's getting it or not. Who you looking at? Oh, he loves uh, you. Uh, Stephanie Reed said, watching the podcast, Abby said, you deny it, but you like that dog. It's obvious. <laughs> uh, well, certainly, you know. I you, like Kyler. You, you love him. We're not uh, going to let him stay here too long. Yeah. We want to make sure he's not uncomfortable. Well, I, well, let me see here. What I saw some folks had some uh, comments here. Uh, did you get a sticker to cover the yoga sign on your computer? I will actually. I will probably do that uh, eventually, yeah. Um, I should wake up our puppy to watch Joel. Ah, funny. Dan says, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Now we got uh, um, KD. Go. Hey, good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Um, we're going to come back to Justin Cox's verse. Uh, well, we could. Well, Justin Cox says, Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles, mm-hmm. preach among the dogs, <laughs> the unsearchable riches of Christ. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> um, I had a I have an opening monologue. I did I put a monologue together just for you. Oh, I remember uh, last uh, last night I went digging for an old 2019 article that I loved that was in uh, Berean. I'm sorry, Biblical Archaeological Society about dogs in the Bible. Oh boy! Uh, from it's called uh, From Pets to Physicians: Dogs in the Biblical World by Justin David Strong. And so first it starts with some archaeology. Of course they would. It's an archaeological, archaeology-focused magazine. But they say that by the fourth millennium B.C., we have solid evidence of human and canine companionship in the ancient Near East. Hunting dogs appear, appear on early Egyptian and Assyrian artwork. And already on Tablet 6 of the Epic Gilgamesh, which refers to sheepdogs tending flocks. Uh, In the Levant, uh, domesticated dogs have been uncovered among the earliest destruction layers of Jericho from the Neolithic period, and hundreds of dogs were uncovered at the city of Ashkelon from the Persian period. I bet you didn't know that. I did not know that, brother. I didn't either. But it says here, in spite of the uh, evidence from ancient Israel's predecessors and neighbors... It's long been common wisdom among scholars that dogs would have been considered unclean to the Jews, but one would search in vain to find dogs among the list of unclean animals in the Mosaic Law. And he said we must add that there are a number of scattered mentions of dogs in the Bible demonstrating that the ancient Israelites interacted with them just like the rest of the Near East and all of us. He said, Job, for example, mentions in passing the dogs tending his flocks in Job 30, verse 1. Isaiah 56, 10 and 11 refers to guard dogs. Yeah. We find that dogs are used in insults and comparisons carrying negative connotations, such as Mephibosheth, and when he was groveling to David, and, when he, and he said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Wow. Dogs are also depicted as interacting with dead bodies. For example, 2 Kings 9.10, <laughs> And the dogs shall eat Jezebel in the Ooh. portion of Jezreel, and there shall be none to bury her. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's the well, kind the of man that makes have, me happy. Yeah, the dogs should have been used to dig the holes to bury the people. Um, uh, but uh, I guess Well, and not. you consider in the New Testament, domestic uh, table dogs are used... In a metaphor, you remember with the Syrophoenician woman in yes. Matthew 15. You remember? We go, we go to that all the time to make a dispensational distinction there. You know, when, they, when the, you had that Syrophoenician woman who wanted to uh, have, um, I think it was her daughter, was demon-possessed. And the Lord said, I'm not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And she said, Lord, help me. And he, uh, he said, it is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. And she said, truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And we make the point here, yeah. you know, the, um, you know the, the dispensational distinction here. Christ was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus wasn't talking to you. But the point here, but the but here you have a reference to domesticated dogs within the life of Israel. Yeah, um, well, eating you, crumbs off the master's table. I I think it's important because you know you've gotten and I've heard several comments and some people and especially a lot of the ladies 
um, that really may not truly have d done some study and, and really understand uh, get offended when uh, you know they're they're thinking okay the Lord called this woman a dog and you know what is, her response to the Lord Jesus Christ wasn't hey don't call me a dog you know <laughs> she didn't she didn't get upset or anything she was subservient she understood her position and yeah. and I thought it was is great you know uh, that you know that was that was it she was going to take her place understanding that her blessings flowed or would flow from the nation israel the uh, and so uh, i look at that in a very positive way i do too in addition to the familiar roles of hunter sheep dog guard dog and house pet the dog had a particular reputation that is largely foreign to us today this kind of blew my mind a little bit i'm not sure about some of this but as the, he, he, the dogs were in the old days were viewed as the physician of the animal kingdom, ancient authors noted, for example, that the dog knows that it should elevate an injured leg, following what uh, Hippocrates uh, pre prescribed. Alongside other evidence, the ancient observers saw that the dog knows what plants to eat as medicine to induce yeah. vomiting if it has eaten something that upsets its stomach. Yeah. That the dog knows to remove foreign bodies like thorns. And that the dog knows to lick its wounds to ensure that they remain clean, understanding that the clean wounds heal more quickly. Yep. Now, the last bit of popular knowledge about the dog's skill to heal through licking and the medical use of its saliva is attested elsewhere um, in the, in the a ancient days. And you consider the story of Luke, in Luke 16 of Lazarus and the rich man. Right. Right. You have you have a Lazarus was lying at the gate. And the Lord said, and he and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the, and, the, and the, he says the function of the dogs licking Lazarus has traditionally been understood by scholars to be a signal of extreme misery. But Lazarus must be so that you know the fact that the, the idea that Lazarus got to be so weak that he can't drive away these unclean dogs who are making a meal of him so the so the old in interpretation goes right but right. but really this act would have been perceived by everybody including the lord's audience when he gave this uh, gave this parable uh, he, that this was a sign of sympathy from the dogs yep. who have been caring after Lazarus like nurses. Right. And he said uh, the, the recognizing that rich Jews would have owned table dogs just as their Roman neighbors allows us to see that Lazarus is longing for the place of the rich man's table dog to eat the dinner scraps the status of the dog as an adopted member of the ancient family household additionally helps us better understand the depravity of the rich man who does not offer to lazarus even this lowliest dignity and perhaps the most powerful insight brought to this parable from our corrected understanding of dogs in the ancient world comes in the peculiar request of the rich man in the afterlife for Lazarus to give him a drop of water on his tongue to quench his pain. In keeping with the Greek tradition of eternal torments that fit earthly crimes, the last detail we learn about Lazarus before he dies is that he is soothed by the wet tongues of the dogs. The first detail we learn about the rich man in his misery is that he begs for a wet tongue. Wow. Delicious <laughs> irony, indeed. Amen. Right? Amen. That's cool. Yeah. I, that's really cool. Yeah, I notice with Kyler a lot of times if 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 I'm feeling not real well and everything, he <laughs> Kyler can sense it. You know, it it just seems like you know if he's on the if he's on the floor, and I I say to him, Kyler, you know, Daddy's not feeling real well. Kyler will jump in the bed right then, and yeah. uh, he's there. You know. And so uh, they have a sense about them, and it gives a new meaning to the to the wet kisses you get from them. Oh, yeah, because it's actually good for you. <laughs> not, maybe not after they eat poo or something, yeah. but it's really, or vomit or whatever. Yeah, but it's good for you. Next time I get a, a bad sore or I get a, 
get a cut or whatever. <laughs> I'm not putting medicine on it. I'm going to use Kyler's tongue, and I'm going to see how fast it heals. If it heals as well as salt water, that would be great. <laughs> salt water usually is probably about the best thing you can put on a cut or a sore. This is the Grace Life Podcast. Amen. We are your mad, bad brothers and dogs in Christ. <laughs> Mad in the sense of mid axe dispensational, bad in the sense of blessed and delivered. Amen. Oh, Abby, you watching? Abby, you out there? You watching? <laughs> Yay. There you go. That's uh. for you, Abby. Um, the uh, we got we uh, uh, we got some links beneath the video. I got all kinds of goodies beneath the video, man. You have no idea. I got t- I got tons of stuff. Um, there's uh, first of all, there's a link to a free book that's available called Empowered by His Grace, which is all about. What God made you in his son, dead, buried, risen with him, the old Jew gone forever, freed from the power and the dominion of sin. Reckon it so. Live your life. Rejoice. Uh, So check that out. We've got that. We've got uh, uh, all kinds of other stuff. There's a link to a page on our website where you could financially support the ministry. So if you appreciate the fellowship and the and the edific- and feel like you've been edified and you kind of enjoy hanging here it does take money to keep all this running so we would appreciate any any uh support financial support anyone can give you could do it through um paypal cash app or just send a check or money order to the church and and just make it payable to F fellowship bible church um i've, I've got other stuff beneath that that's pretty incredible I, I let me let me get down here um now in the uh, in, in under videos, there's a few things worth mentioning. I have uh, the play, link to the playlist for Brian, Brian uh, Brian's Grace History Project. Uh, he's, he's been reposting all of those old uh, videos. Um, he also um, there is also a video he posted this morning, um, and it's totally epic. I watched it Tuesday. Um, it's all about he he asked the question: Is the two streams of Bibles? paradigm of preservation or transmission correct it's it's a really good video it's it's worth your time um he he is talking about a subject i think he covered many uh really a lot of years ago in the from this generation forever about the the paradigm of the pure stream and the impure stream when it comes to translations got it got it brother um yeah we put kyler down for a little while i think he's gonna be fine so there's some shocking stuff in there. He makes a point that Gail Kiplinger absolutely go, outright deceives people in her book. Who does? Gail Kiplinger. Ripplinger? Or Ripplinger? Kiplinger? I, Ripplinger? I was thinking it was Gail, that Gail Ripplinger. Woman. <laughs> I was thinking it was Ripplinger. I told, I told him. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's Ripplinger. I told, well, okay. I may I, be wrong. I stand corrected. Well, you um, may not I, be. But I told him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Gail Ripplinger. Yeah. yeah. Gale force winds of hot air is what I, uh, is what I told Brian. Wow. Um, and it's really true, and it's uh, it's really it's really worth watching. Uh, he really challenges a lot of thinking, and I think it's a it's a really good thing, and it's a, it's a conversation that's worthy of having. Uh, plus, I got to mention that um, there's a link to uh, Ted Fellows' conference. Ted Fellows had a conference oh, recently wonderful. with wow. uh, with a with a with a guy named Brandon Smith. Wow, totally epic! I think there's like four messages there. Check that out. Also, I noticed he has a new playlist for his nine. Uh, judgment seat of Christ uh, messages that is worth your time absolutely um, the uh, oh thank you Abby I see I saw the text your mother sent <laughs> uh, the uh, there's also a playlist uh, for another conference the uh, charity grace Bible camp check that out uh, links to all kinds of other goodies uh, and messages uh, beneath that so check it all out I gotta we got it we got to get back in the house here and see who else we've got here with us and uh, uh, Freddie Bear is, I know he's got a doctor's appointment today. I hope you're doing great, man. Yeah. I hope that uh, that appointment goes well. Um, uh, let me see here. What else do we have? Do you know? Let me get back over here. Um, I think I lost some of the chat here. Uh, hey, we got William Barron's in the house. How you doing? Dan the man, I love you, big yeah, guy. How you Dan doing, big man. guy? Um uh, K. Deco is in the house. We got you, Yida. How are you? Hey, hey, hey. Uh, William Barron. So I've got, uh, yeah, promoted your pastor. He's been doing a really good job. How was that? Con- how did you, did you enjoy that conference with Brandon? How was that? I've not seen those messages yet. I think he posted them last night, maybe. Um, I very much, uh, I very much like Brandon, and I would very much watch four messages of him if, if it's totally epic. Um, and we got Valerie. How are you? 
Jones is here. Um, it is so great seeing you guys. Uh, Dan says no puppy music. That's right. <laughs> um, <laughs> William Barron says his fridge died. <laughs> um, Kyler is exploring just, the auditorium. Yeah, absolutely. Did you know? Did you know that in the in the in the uh, Mosaic Law, it was illegal to bring a dog into the synagogue? Oh my goodness! It, yeah, it was illegal. Ooh. I saw that. Well, I, I saw that last night. Okay. Totally illegal. Isn't it, doesn't it feel good to break the Mosaic Law? Oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, does, it, does that make you worry a little bit? Yeah, I'm just glad we're not a synagogue. So that way, if we've got somebody yeah. watching uh, that may have yeah. Jew Jewish that's, heritage, that's the only thing uh, the law we, said about the dog. We'd be in trouble. Well, the expression goes not to, not to bring in the price of a dog or something like that. Oh. I'm not quite sure I understood. Okay. Hey, we got Bob Picard in the house. How you hey. doing? Uh, Dan says, does Kyler fight Joel for the cold pizza? Uh, <laughs> uh, Kyler gets the crust uh, normally. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we got Valerie here, Justin Cox, Jake Holdsworth. Dude, it's so awesome to see you. How you doing, man? Um, um, there's a lot of love going on around here. I cannot hear anything because the puppy is so loud trying to get uh, Kyler. Oh, oh, he's he has a puppy with him to, to oh, watch Kyler. That's okay. what he's saying. Well, I put uh, Kyler, he's down for a while. It doesn't take much to wear him out. <laughs> so, uh, so he's just uh, Joan sitting says, at our uh, feet right now. Joel looks like he has just been CS gassed. Uh, <laughs> Tuyita says all dogs go to heaven. Uh, okay. Kayadiko says, <laughs> well, I, I, I hope that's true, <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> uh, actually, there's a verse in Ecclesiastes okay. about right, their spirits going down into the earth, but okay. I guess we okay. should probably sit and burst yeah. anyone's bubble. Yeah, don't. I was just going to say that. Don't burst anybody's bubble. Um, yeah, Kay says, oh, Kyler, the chair is too small for him to lay down on. That uh, was the widest chair we could find in yeah, this church building. Yeah. Eli Stewart is in the house. How you doing? Uh, it says, every day is a bad day in Christ. Good morning. Amen. Good morning to you, man. Valerie quotes uh, Isaiah 40, verse 5. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Amen. Oh, that makes me excited. That's going to be. That is just epic. I just think of that, and when I just to think, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Isn't that that's going to be something? That that's gonna, even going to be people that I'm sure that are unbelievers that are going to be, mm. you know, taking a bow and and having to confess. <laughs> that Jesus is Lord. I mean, um, you know? Kyler, oh my goodness! They're like, oh, I guess apparently at some point Kyler was uh, watching, uh, watching, uh, listening while I was reading the Dogs in the Bible monologue. And <laughs> <laughs> Look at Kyler, listen to what Joel is reading. He's so attentive. Yeah. Uh, Kyler and I have spent many hours studying the Bible together. <laughs> He's, that's not. Um, so. Wow. Uh, Valerie, Valerie quotes Genesis seven fifteen, and they went in unto Noah into the ark two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. Right, right, exactly. God gave God gave animals the breath of life too. <laughs> um, there's uh, let me let me get through the comments here. There is uh, oh, Valerie says Joel is putting Kyler to sleep. Yeah, I do that with the people too, but <laughs> the dogs worst of all. Uh -oh. Yeah. Uh, certainly. If you start hearing Kyler howl, then you'll know that Joel is getting on his nerves. But I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, Jesus. Uh, okay. So, uh, Kay says, I do not. Uh, broken heart emoji. I wish I did. Uh, but when someone cheats on someone, they get called a dog. And Jesus did not answer the woman if. If I ask my husband questions, he never answers me right away, and that hurts. The point of, of what was going on in Israel, especially in Matthew 15, is that Christ came into the world for the sake, first and foremost, to, the, to his own people. And, so, and you have in John 4.22, salvation is of the Jews. And you have him, um, you know, it is important to make sure that the point is made and understood. I mean, Christ was willing to make an exception for that Syrophoenician woman, but th the point had to be made before he did that he's not sent but under the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
And why is that? I mean, it's not that God didn't love the Gentiles. The whole thing, everything in the in the Gospels was about the Gentiles because the end game Amen. was the fact that the Jews were going to go out and bring salvation to the nations and the Gentiles. And, but before they could do that, they had to get their act together to become that nation of priests they needed to be in order to fulfill God's role to go out into the world and offer salvation to the Gentiles. Um, so... You know, I would just just keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. God absolutely loved the Gentiles, Amen. and he wanted them saved desperately. Uh, but the plan and the method was to have a kingdom of priests that would go out and, and deliver that good news of Christ and the Messiah. They were the instruments of his salvation that would be offered to the Gentiles. The, the, the salvation of the Gentiles was the whole point of everything. That's the end game of the gospel of the kingdom. Um. Uh, so let me see here. What else we got? We've got, uh, uh, Karen says, Ripplinger. Thank you. Ripplinger. Yeah. Um, let me see. Uh, Kyler, the abomination of desolation, Valerie says. Uh, that's right. Uh, Chris, uh, Chris Nelson's in the house. Hi, all. Great message last night. I'm even more longing for the rapture now. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Lots yeah. and lots of angels at the rapture. That's wow. the point. We got David Garnett in the house. How are you? Praise the Lord. Um, Karen says, Mom and stepdad have CV. Dad was put in the hospital yesterday. I'm waiting on my test results. Okay. Oh, boy. We will, pray. We will continue to keep praying for you and for your entire family, especially your stepdad and your mom. Absolutely. Um, Karen says, I'm curious to hear how you know Kyler howls when Joel gets on his nerves. <laughs> I don't know if, I, if I've gotten on his nerves yet. Yeah. No, I I, oh, one time when, well, oh, that, that was, yeah, when that we was, were playing, so yeah, something was, happened, and he, but that was more of a physical thing, um, you know. Spiritually, I think he's pretty sound, yeah. Um, you should be, he should be okay. Uh, let me see here. I've got, I actually have tons and tons of news. I don't know where to, I don't know where to start. Um, the good news or the bad news? There's all kinds news. of news, yeah. Um, you know, YouTube's taking away the uh, dislike. <laughs> which was yeah. which is crazy uh -huh. um there was um i'll i'll start with how about we start with children since okay. we have abby is here and we got uh, not that abby's uh, she's well beyond her years uh there was um faith wire had an article last night that i thought was amazing about a baby had virtually no chance of survival and then broke the guinness's world book of records uh, uh, and he's the. This was uh, by Billy Hollowell in Faithwire, and uh, it says uh, babies like Curtis have virtually zero chance of survival. Yet this amazing child, born at 21 weeks and one day gestation, defied all expectations and is now being recognized by Guinness World Records. Plainly stated, no one has ever been born so young and survived. Wow. Uh, Curtis's harrowing story is deeply intriguing. There. Things were going well for this expectant mom, Michelle Butler, during her pregnancy, and then she went into premature labor on uh, July 4th of 2020 and was rushed to the hospital, and that's when everything took a dire turn. Uh, Curtis was delivered 132 days premature. Unreal. Weighing less than a pound. Wow. And he had a twin who died mm. day after her birth. And uh, by all accounts, the prognosis for the small baby was grim, but alas, a miracle unfolded. Curtis overcame every obstacle, is now healthy, and has been designated by Guinness as the world's most premature baby to survive. Uh, Doctors are stunned. Yep, they don't have an answer for it, and it's amazing. You know, they're still finding out, you know, with the cures. Oh, and yeah. How the body can, can actually heal itself, you know, it's, it's um, amazing. They quote Dr. Colm Travers, an assistant professor at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, uh, said that survival at this gestational age has never happened before. So before Curtis was born, his chances of survival would have been far less than 1%. Wow. He was astounded to see the child responding so well to treatments the day after his birth, and as time progressed... Curtis just kept defying the odds. With a less than one chance of survival, he wasn't giving up. 
Uh, Curtis defined all scientific odds, uh, Traverse uh, said, uh, gestational age and birth weight are two key predictors of a premature baby survival, and other factors include if the baby is a female, a single birth, and if the mother was administered steroids that help with lung development before birth. Curtis did not meet any of that criteria. Hmm. The situation didn't come without its challenges either. The baby spent 275 days in the hospital. Wow. Needed help learning how to eat. He still requires oxygen and a feeding tube, and doctors say some uncertainty still abounds. Dr. Brian Sims, who uh, treated Curtis, said there's, there's no blueprint to follow here. <laughs> there is no one else like him. But it's likely his journey will help doctors uh, better treat other kids uh, like him in the future. Um, isn't that amazing? That is and amazing. And they just say, thank God for this miracle. Yeah. And to pray for that family. I thought that was amazing. How old is, the, how old is that child now? Or the baby? Uh, born in... Where, when was it? Tw uh, 2020. It was like... 2020, so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let me see, probably a year old, over, well, over a year. Well, his, a year and a half now. What was yeah. it like? July 4th, 2020. Well, his, his brother at least uh, went to be with the Lord, so... Praise the Lord for that. Uh, there was another article about children. Uh, from uh, this comes from uh, actually, uh, let me. I'll share these articles in the live chat. Um, and then there was this article from uh, Christian Headlines. I thought it was pretty amazing. Um, uh, Twenty-six students gather outside of a hospital to sing worship songs to a teacher battling stage four cancer. Oh, Nate. A group of elementary school students in Wisconsin recently paid a heartwarming visit to their teacher who is currently battling stage 4 cancer. Last Wednesday, 26 students and their parents, some of whom were former students of the teacher, stood outside the hospital entrance <coughs> to visit and sing worship songs to teacher Carol Mack. Over the past 45 years, Mack taught first and second grade students at uh, Christ Lutheran School in Big Bend. According to Facebook post uh, by uh, Aurora Healthcare in Milwaukee, Mac continued to teach at the school this year despite battling cancer. And as her condition worsened, Mac uh, had to step away. In response, one of Mac's friends, a fellow teacher, sought to reunite her with the... Kyler just laid on my foot. I know. He's laying at the foot of the master. Go ahead. <laughs> he's just looking for crumbs. <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah. he's like, that's a good idea. I should hang out by that table. He heard that. Yeah. yeah. Right. Oh, my goodness. He, he's going to take his place. All right. Uh, in any event, it was overwhelming and special, they say, these kids singing worship songs outside the hospital, and wow. apparently everybody cried. Um, all right. And then we <laughs> – I got some hero stories also. Uh, there was a – story of this uh, uh, this also this is from Faithwire even more hit. hero rescues unconscious man from train tracks just seconds before his car is obliterated uh, mm -hmm. we have I have had nothing but hero stories all I mean these Christian news sites they've, I've seen a lot of hero stories this week Wow. Uh, it says an Illinois resident is being hailed Citizen of the Year after pulling an unconscious man to safety just moments before an oncoming train obliterated his vehicle. He mm. says Louis Medina, uh, 60, sprung into action on October the 9th when he saw a car in the middle of the tracks. So he calls 911. And when he realized there was a man inside the car who couldn't get him out, get himself out in time he took matters into his own hands wow. so medina says oh my gosh there's a train coming and uh medina uh, can be heard frantically proclaiming on that nine uh 911 call let me try to get him out so he bolted to toward the car and what was in the car was a 72 year old victim who was un unconscious that's why he was on the tracks he and so he got in he got he he got in he he grabbed the guy in a bear hug and yanked him out of the car through the window. And at first he struggled to free him and then I hear the train horn blow. So now I'm really panicking. <laughs> so I decided wow. to grab him by the shirt and his pants legs and pull him out of the vehicle. Wow. He pulled the man to safety just in time as the event would have been potentially deadly. As soon as I got him at the bottom of the hill, the train smashed the car. Wow. 
Uh, here's what's so remarkable about this story. They say Medina clearly knew the dangers at hand, and yet he sacrificed his own safety for a stranger. Yeah. In a simple news mention, yet profound lesson in what it really looks like to love others. He said, uh, Medina says, I knew it was close, but I couldn't leave him on the tracks. So there was no way. I had to get him out. Mm. Now he's being recognized for his incredible life-saving act. And uh, the county gave him a uh, Citizen of the Year award this year. The victim, who is reportedly doing well, didn't attend the ceremony, but uh, Medina cried. And uh, so that was that. And, and I have another story of another hero. Uh, I think for every episode, this every podcast this week, we've had at least two hero stories. <laughs> uh, here's another guy who uh, this is another kind of similar. He had no idea his car was on fire until a stranger wow. forced him to pull over <laughs> just before it exploded. Oh, my goodness. Isn't that something? <laughs> Golly. Uh, there was a truly nail-biting close call on an interstate in Salt Lake City, Utah, on Friday when a man noticed smoke and massive flames coming from underneath a nearby car. And that's when this, uh, this uh, hero, Caden Pabst, P-A-B-S-T, uh, successfully dragged down the driver and convinced him to pull over just in time. Wow. I was yelling, move over right now, move over. And when he gave me the thumbs up, I was like, no, move over, move over now. Mm. And, the, and his, his quick thinking and kind move might have literally saved the, uh, saved the man's life after the car was parked. Paps ran over and told the guy to grab his belongings and flee the vehicle. And not long after, the, the car exploded. That's unreal. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. It was massive. Um, pretty solid 10 feet in the air. It was a lot of fire. Wow. You just heard a massive explosion, and we went over there, and there was little bits of his engine everywhere. It was crazy. Mm. Isn't that unbelievable? Yeah, I guess if I saw a car that, there, you know, sometimes you see when radiators overheat or whatever, and you see smoke coming out. But if you actually saw a little bit of fire coming out of the car, right. I, I, I would think you would want to force somebody to to pull, <laughs> yeah, pull over, over as quick as they can. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Especially if it's in near in the rear end of the car where you see the fire. There are heroes in the world. Yes. There are heroes in the world. There's a lot of bad stuff. Probably it's going to get things are going to get rough. Be the hero. There's going to be more heroes, I'm sure. Be the hero. the way the world is right now. And you think, okay, what, some heroes of the Bible. Uh, what, oh. what would be some heroes of the Bible? Well, I say Hebrews 11. The Faith Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 11. I mean, go from verse 1 all the way down to verse 40. Hebrews 11. Read that chapter. There you go. You got a, you got a list of heroes who... Um, who, having obtained a good report through faith, uh, actually, they who, uh, um, oh, here, who through faith, Hebrews eleven thirty three, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight. The, uh, turned to fight the enemies, the armies of the aliens. Armies of the aliens. Uh, women received, uh, and it goes on. These saints are heroes. The great faith hall of fame. Great. Study those yeah. stories. And then consider how you can be a hero. Be a hero in your own life with the people you know and you love. God wants you to be a hero. I love, I love that idea. Um, let me see here. We've got, uh, there's, there's, uh, all kinds of other stuff I've got here. It's just amazing. Um, there's another. There's another thing. Uh, let me. Maybe this will get. Um, this will get Mike worked up. Let me see if I can get Mike worked up here. <laughs> oh, who <gosh. laughs> This article. So, no. <laughs> this article is about how there is a uh, debate within the Southern Baptist Convention yeah. about basically women teachers, women pastors. And uh, there's a debate about what is called complementarianism. Uh, we just basically quote what Paul says, I suffer a woman not to teach. <laughs> but um, it was 1 Timothy 2.12. Uh, but complementarianism is the fancy word uh, uh, Calvinists like to give this whole, you know, take that idea of, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, men and women being equal but have separate functions in the body of Christ. That's complementarianism. We would, I would totally agree with that, yeah. except I just 
don't feel the need to have a big five dollar word to explain <laughs> that particular point. I would just explain huh, the point. Yeah. But because of this fight over women at, at functioning as pastors and teachers within the local assemblies, you now have a new assault on the authority of Paul because of what he said in First Timothy two twelve. That's the point. There's there's a new. Uh, is there has been this new attack on Paul, his authority as an apostle, his epistles, uh, basically saying, "Yeah, Paul, he, um, yeah, I mean, you don't, I mean, it's not like it's the words of Jesus, yep. you know." And yep. and and, it's, and you know, Paul is uh, is is this is this perhaps maybe Paul speaking for himself? Like this is what he does, but it doesn't necessarily mean that this is what I have to do, yep. kind of thing. Yeah, those are the kinds of excuses they're using to sure. Make those verses not mean what they say and not apply to us in any way or fashion. What's your yeah. reaction to that, Mike? Well, it, it's just another attack on the Word of God, and, and that shouldn't be new to us. We know the first thing that Satan attacked in the Garden of Eden was the Word of God. <laughs> and, and why would it be any different right. today? Right. I think it's, it's, it's kind of, when you hear a little bit of history on the Southern Baptists, one of the issues they were dealing with many years ago um, I think uh, when Billy Graham came out, um, they came out with the, basically it was like the NIV Bible. Right. Um, you know, it was a different Bible that, because the Southern Baptists were always using a King James Version. And then they kind of went from using the NIV to a uh, new King James Version, right. which still uh, is a different. And they thought with the Bible, uh, and if they taught out of the Bible and said that, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. They say they believe that, right? Right, right. And so uh, what they were going to do is see people having less problems in, in everyday life and that there was going to be less sin in the, in the churches. Right. Well, <laughs> that didn't work very well. Right. So they actually ended up going back to a King James Bible. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I, I think it just, this is all Satan has to do. Right. All Satan has to do is sit back, and we know the most dangerous doctrine is for people to be, uh, that's out there, is to be scriptural, but not be dispensational. dispensational. Yep. And how true that is. So, um, now, there's a verse you often quote, uh, you, you often quoted on the podcast here. Uh, uh, there was a little verse in 1 Corinthians 14, 20. Oh, okay. yeah. 14. The words that I speak unto you are the commandments of, of the Lord. Lord. Yep. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. And now, then, yeah. so you have the, the argument against uh, what these uh, Southern Baptists are saying is. Yeah, even Paul himself tells you that the words that I speak unto you yeah. are the commandments of the Lord. Well, and, go, ahead. go ahead. No, no, no go ahead. No, bro. I was going to say t the two decisions that that I had to make, I, I, that I did make, I didn't have to make, was number one was I going to believe that it was the faith of Jesus Christ that I was going to rest my faith in for eternal life. But then, after I got saved. I used to ask myself the question that's asked in Romans chapter 6. Well, God, you didn't save me just so I could continue to live in sin, did you? <laughs> and, and so, you know, I hadn't even really done a study on that, on the identification right. and everything else. But until you make the next, the, the, the second decision I was going to, that I, I needed to make was, since there were so many Bibles out there, and, and the problem was I, I would listen to radio stations and TV stations, and, and one minute you're saved, the next minute you're lost, and one minute you can speak in tongues, right. and the next, you know. Right. And so I'm hearing all these things, and I said, surely God wants, you know, he's not the author of confusion. Right. And so... That decision of if God is speaking to me, to me today, where what what Bible am I going to use? Right. Because not only do I want to know what God wants me to do today, I want to make sure that I'm using a Bible that doesn't say that it's not the faith of Jesus Christ that saves me. It, it's by your works or whatever. Um, and so... Coming to that decision was just a major decision, right? Uh, and I think most people would probably identify with that, right? Um, I love how um, now I love how in First Corinthians fourteen thirty seven, mm -hmm. Paul challenges the pe before he talks about everything he's writing being the commandments of the Lord. He challenges them: 
if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual. Yeah. I mean, if you even think of yourself as spiritual, then acknowledge that the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Amen. <laughs> now, then yeah. the argument would be, well, now, didn't, yeah. didn't, weren't there pa- times when Paul said, not, uh, you know, th- you know, I speak with permission that, uh, you know, the Lord didn't command me to say this. This is me speaking. Yeah, he did that. Talking about the virgins. Um, but uh, at the same time, is not all scripture given by inspiration of God? Yeah. And you consider the fact that even the Apostle Paul, even with the spiritual gifts, there are actually two references in the book of Acts uh, telling us that Paul was filled with the Holy Ghost in that same manner that Peter and the Twelve were filled with the Holy Ghost in, at Pentecost. He, he was... He was, you know, even even then, even when he's speaking on his own volition, it's when the framework and the context of grace, understanding yeah. it better than anybody on the planet, <laughs> and then in the very fact that it exists in Scripture means it's inspired of God. Yeah. So you know, <laughs> um, you know, when in- there's there's no way you can discount, you can ever say uh, about the Apostle Paul. Yeah, uh, we don't have to listen to Paul. You know, you've got these red letter Christians saying, "Yeah, I'm just going to stick with the words of Jesus." Yeah. You know, oh yeah. Uh, you know, Paul, who's Paul? We had a member here who said, uh, "Yeah, just ignore Paul. Just stick with the Gospels. You'll be okay." You know. Yeah, uh, I, you know, and and we look at. Uh, I think there's three warnings in the Bible written in three different places that talk about adding to the word, right? Uh, deleting from the word and right. changing and that, right? Those were exactly the same things that Satan did when he was sat there and deceived Eve. There's no difference. Satan really doesn't have to do a whole lot, you know. Right. Um, right. And and it's it's a shame. Um, I think there are a lot of bro- that we have brothers and sisters in Christ, and there's a lot of them from all different denominations. And I rejoice and praise the Lord that you know because of uh, salvation, you know, the gift of eternal life. Their works may burn up, but they themselves <laughs> they, they themselves will be saved. Right, um, and it and it goes back to you either you read it, you believe it, and you trust it. And you're again, I go back to the three issues that I see for the church, the body of Christ, is number <laughs> one, we're saved according to Paul's gospel. I think everybody would say amen, and they would go. <laughs> they would they would go to First Corinthians fifteen verses one through four, and they would go to First Corinthians uh, what is it five twenty one. Second Corinthians five twenty one, and everybody would say amen. <laughs> and then when you go to how is a believer now matured and grounded and rooted to where they don't get tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine that's out there. And it's according to Paul's gospel that we're established, <laughs> we're grounded, we're rooted, Preach we're it, brother, matured, give it to me. and we can have fellowship <laughs> together, and we can rejoice in our identity and who God has made us in his son. And I can get an amen go to boy, that. Go. Everybody, I'll get an amen from that to, boy. from somebody that doesn't rightly divide. <laughs> and, and they don't even think about what I'm saying. They just hear we, we give glory to the Lord. Um, and then third of all, And I think it's so critical. If you'll read Romans 2.16, in the day when, what is it? Uh, uh, It talks about in the day. uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the live chat here trying to get. I'm having a how thing. I'm sorry. Oh, I know. Romans 2.16. Oh, Romans 2.16. Let me me read it because. That goes to show you, I have to study. And the, uh, in the day when God shall judge the, the secrets, secrets of men, men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. So. Yeah. And, and so you think at the judgment seat of Christ, it says that we're going to be judged according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> Is that what we're going to be judged according to? Are we going to be judged uh, according to Daniel? Uh, are we going to be judged? You know, is, we're going to be judged according to Paul's gospel. And so I think that's the thing. People just don't want to submit. Right. I think it was the same as when Moses was there. People didn't want to submit to a man. They didn't want to submit to Moses, but they didn't. They should have known that when they didn't submit to Moses, they were not submitting to the Lord. 
And the same goes if, 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 if that religious world out there is not going to submit to Paul's gospel and how we're established and how we're going to be judged and all that, then they're disobeying what God would have for them. Plus, the end result is they will never, right. never come to the knowledge of the truth. They will never have that. Uh, uh, exactly. The, and you think about the... Uh, with this whole um, with that with this whole assault on um, Paul's authority and then you have on the other hand uh, you know people that I know would be out there saying no Mike no no Joel the all the Bible is written to us it's mm -hmm. all about us there's only one gospel yeah. you know uh, and and you just have to go really well did, did you know that Paul highlights two gospels in Galatians 2 7 yeah. you know the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter uh, how do you reconcile those two gospels and of course I know the the answer would be well it's the same gospel but a different audience yeah so, well okay so how do you explain Matthew 10 7 you know, with the which in which Christ said, "Okay, as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give." Is that what you preach in your church today? Is that what you say? When, when, that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. When was the last time you raised somebody from the dead, brother? When was the, the and you, of course you have, uh, as, as Mike referenced, Paul saying, a, talking about a completely different gospel here. I declared unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and then he was buried, and he rose again the third day, right? And you have to make that distinction between you know what had taken place in the gospels and paul's epistles you have in the you have to understand the context of the gospels you have the promise of the redeemer after the fall in the garden you have the promise given to abraham of a nation and a land and then you have the promise of a kingdom given to david the davidic king the the, the davidic covenant the kingdom to come and you have the redeemer christ coming into this world who will sit on that david's throne and he's going to rule on this earth so when the, when the nation of Israel, when you have in the gospel period, everybody screaming that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right. They're talking about that prophesied earthly kingdom that all the prophets spoke about in the Old Testament. How that kingdom that was promised that we've been waiting for hundreds of years is now finally here. Our Messiah has arrived, yeah, it, and it is time to come to him in faith and follow him in obedience. Yeah, in the kingdom gospel, this is one thing they could never say, you know, Matthew, <laughs> Mark, Luke, and John. This is probably why uh, Paul went and met with them in Galatia. But just remember in uh, 2 Timothy 2, 7, <laughs> it says, Remember that Jesus Christ, oh, let's start in uh, yeah, 2, 7. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to the, king, uh, the kingdom gospel. <laughs> it does not say according to the kingdom gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Right. And I keep hearing, and, and maybe you can help me, brother, I don't know. Uh, that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are, are New Testament. I, 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 yeah. I'm believing they're Old Testament. Yep. Because until the death of a testator, yep. uh, you cannot have the new right. covenant, right? right? right. So are, would those not be Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? They right. would actually be Old Testament right. books? Right. I would totally agree. Uh, so, well, you uh, have, and you consider too, you have Christ telling the disciples, you know, he says, go not into the way of the Gentiles, yep. and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You know, is, is that... Is that what we do today? You know, are, are you avoiding the Gentiles? Are you avoiding the Samaritans? And, and are you only speaking to the lost sheep of the house of Israel? That's what Jesus said. Mm -hmm. That's in your red letter Bible. Yeah. That's, uh, I mean, if you're only going, if you're going to ignore Paul, dismiss Paul, discount Paul and only follow Jesus, then why aren't you doing that? You know, is, is that 
truly God's plan for us today? You know, Paul said, and you think of Colossians 1, 27, 28, he says, God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is among the Gentiles, you know, yeah. mystery, the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope Amen. of glory. Whom we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Amen. And we have, of course, as we started at the very beginning of the podcast, the Christ telling the Gentile woman, that Syrophoenician woman, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You have Paul saying in Romans ten twelve that there is no difference between Jew and Greek. So who are you going to follow? Yeah. You're going to follow what Christ said? Or are you going to follow what Paul says when he says that there is now no difference between Jew and Greek anymore? And I know that some of the, um, my dear Baptist brothers, uh, I've had this question many, many times, so much so I had to put it in my book. Uh, but the question always comes up. What about, what about the thief on the cross? Wasn't he a Gentile? Yeah. What, about, what about him? You know, How do you answer that question? Well, let me ask you. What was it that the thief believed when, that got him saved when he was up there on that cross? All right. When he was hanging on that cross, was he sitting there thinking that, okay, Christ is in the process of paying for the sins of the whole mm -hmm. world. I think Christ is in the process of dying, and he's, I believe he's going to be buried, and he's going to be resurrected, because that's what the Old Testament prophet said would happen. Is that what he was thinking? He had no clue. He was a Gentile. Yep. How could he have known that Christ was paying for the sins of the world when even the demonic realm couldn't comprehend it? And Paul said, had, had they known, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. Amen. First Corinthians yep. 2, 8, yep. right? Yep. <laughs> the sea, the, what did the thief believe when he was on that cross? The thief simply believed that Christ was who he was, that Christ was the Messiah, which was the gospel uh, which was the gospel during the Lord's earthly ministry. John 3.16, that's what you believe to get saved. This is not the gospel that Paul preached. Well, the first, was, one, the first one that really would have known if Christ was going to, you know, through all the prophecy and everything that was coming around, and if Ma in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if they would have known that what Christ's death was going to do. Right. The first person that would have known it would have been Satan. Right, <laughs> you right, know? totally. It, it, right. It, he would have known, and he would have said, no, no, get him off that cross. You know, don't, <laughs> right. don't kill him. You That's know? right. That's right. Because that'll be, that'll be the end of me. I mean, the most, brilliant, right. I mean the, the most brilliant just, thing about that cross is you look back on Psalm 22, yeah. Isaiah, and, and it is just, I mean, hidden in plain sight, the crucifixion of Christ. Yeah. You have the foreshadowing through the sacrificial system under the Mosaic law law the death of christ i mean it's all there when you hindsight is 2020 yeah. but it's just amazing how all of that was hidden in plain sight yeah and and <laughs> and the devil who probably knew the bible better than anybody yep. uh couldn't see it he couldn't he see couldn't it. see it yep. couldn't see it coming yeah um i mean now it's just it's so obvious it's like for us now it's you look back and it's like whoa how could you not see it well yeah. you couldn't it was hidden in plain sight. Well, Paul's, you know, and, when we look at Paul, that's in plain sight. Right. I mean, to us, right. if we read it and believe it and right. trust it, the nation Israel, when the Lord Jesus Christ came on the scene and John the Baptist, the forerunner, to pretty much announce that the Lord Jesus, your Messiah, has come, if they would have been good Bible students, <laughs> right, and read the scriptures, right. they would have known that, wait a minute, right. there he is. Yeah, yeah. What's yeah. different today, right, brother, yeah. with right. Paul? You know, it's in plain sight. Everybody can read. Anybody that can read and just read what the words say, you know, and don't try to twist or do anything. Just right. all I had to do, and, and I wasn't very good in high school, <laughs> and all, all through grade school, I didn't like to really read. I didn't like to, you know, I, I just didn't want to learn. Right. And I still got a lot to learn. But <laughs> what I found out, though, was I got challenged by, I think it was Pastor Fred. And, uh, you know, I, I was raised up in, in Catholicism. Mm. And so everything was in Latin. And so I never got involved that much in their religion. I just saw the traditions and everything because I went, right. to, ch I went to church six days a week right. and went to confession at least twice a week. Right. But 
the thing was that they challenged me. They said, Mike, and, and just get you a Bible. And, and they uh, gave me, I think, a, a King, King James Version Bible. And all Fred told me to do was, Mike, just read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then read the book of Acts. And then read the book of Romans. And that was, uh, that's all I needed right there to see that, wait a minute, God is dealing with those people differently than he's dealing with these people over here. Right. Um, and, and that's it. I, and maybe because not being real educated, at least according to the school system and everything <laughs> else, I barely got by by the seat of my pants. But um, I praise the Lord that I had, you know, it talks about the simplicity of the gospel. Mm-hmm. That's what I, I was just a simple person. Yep. And praise God that I could just read it and believe it. But it wasn't until later when I actually really got the, did a study and I understood the faith of, that little two-word letter word, the faith of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. It's his faithfulness. Mm-hmm. It's God the Father that, that he came in the plan and the Lord Jesus Christ said, don't worry, Father, I'm going to die for Mike. I'm going to die for Joel. I'm going to die for the sins of the world. And you know what? I took God at his word. I placed my faith in the faithfulness of, of Jesus Christ to do what he said he would do and that he would die and pay for my sins. And, you know, I think that's one thing that bothers these real educated religious people is when they hear the simplicity of, of the gospel and everything, it bothers them. Because you know what? It they start focusing on themselves whereas you and I we understand the mystery it's Christ in you the hope of glory and and goes back to Galatians 2 20 who is it to live their life through you well it's not the old man because <laughs> he, he, he was crucified at that cross and he's gone all right so who is going to live the, who wants to and desires to live their life through you? And it is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So I leave it at that, brother. I went a little too long there. Oh, no, you did fine. I, no, I'm that's just, awesome. And, and, isn't it nice to know you got a simple grace, mate? I'm, I'm very simple. <laughs> uh, let me see what we got here. We'll get back in the live chat. How about we do that? All right. Uh, we've got Sandra Briggs in the house. How are you? Good morning. Um, it's awesome to see you. I hope you're doing great. Um, I uh, never made it to Brian's conference. A big bummer, she says. Uh, still in rehab. I, and I, I think you just did. I see recently that you got released. Um, and uh, I hope you, I hope you have a f- complete and full recovery. I yeah. truly do. Absolutely. And uh, we will uh, keep you in our prayers. I think I got a. <laughs> you got a spot. Yeah, I got a spot for you. I've got like about a quarter of an inch left. Oh, my goodness. Sandra Briggs. Um, Oh, Dan says we cannot dislike anymore. Actually, I got, yeah, you can, but you can't see the counts. I think that's how it goes. And then I'll give you the, I got that from Newsbusters last night. It's just so bizarre. And I think... You know, the, the thing is, you have <coughs> companies with these really expensive movies that are terribly woke, and it's, and, or, some, or something like that, and they put a commercial out there, and you get, a, a, you know, about a thousand up, thumbs yeah, up, and then right. you get like hundreds of thousands of thumbs down, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, so now there's, I'm sure, it, a lot of corporations had a lot to say about uh, removing the com- total counts of the dislikes. <clears throat> um, it's pretty funny. Pretty funny. Um, uh, Sandra, uh, let me see here. Dan says, uh, if everyone doesn't give a thumbs up, wouldn't that be offending also? A, eh? well, that doesn't stop, it won't stop them from being uh, able to leave comments. <laughs> <laughs> Jones says no dislikes because Sleepy Joe keeps getting uh, 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 race, ratioed 500 dislikes to one. Yep. Uh, Jake, uh, Jake Holdsworth says uh, Romans 12.9, uh, let love be without dissimulation. dissimulation. What does that mean, dissimulation? It means hypocrisy. Without let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. That's mm-hmm. right. 
Which is exactly why Jake cleaves to his beautiful wife, Suzanne. Um, uh, so yeah, we'll keep you in our prayers, both of you guys. Hey, Jake, how's your dad doing? If you're able to leave a comment, I'd love to know, because we do still pray for your dad every once in a while and his spiritual growth. I know you were having um, conversations with him and there were some ministry opportunities there. Love to know how that how that goes. Um, um, oh, she says, I'm going home the 15th. I still love my cat, though. <laughs> uh, and Dan makes the joke, Sandra, really? Rapture coming on the 15th? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, um, uh, Dan says, our puppy is calm now that Kyler is off the TV. Oh, Hilarious. Man. Just did that for you, brother. Yeah. I got Kai. Uh, his, uh, his, his, his puppy always barks at the animals on TV. Oh, my goodness. Uh, they need a recall for those exploding cars. Eh? Yeah, totally. Right. Really pushing electric cars these days. Yes, mm -hmm. they are. Yes, they are. Um um uh uh Lori Howell says I am so much enjoying uh study the Philippians series this morning. I'm wow. hungry for more to study deeper and compare verses. Yeah, I know the feeling. Amen. I know the feeling. That's awesome. I love Philippians. Philippians is a phenomenal book. Mm. Um I think uh when it comes to suffering, Second Corinthians would be at the top of the list. If you're really going through hard times, go through Second Corinthians. But the sec a second to that would be Philippians. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know. Philippians may be on a par there. I love Philippians. Um that's uh that's phenomenal. Yeah, I, I she brought up Philippians and I love that. Um I think it's second uh or Philippians two, uh what is it, thirteen uh I love this. Uh, Philippians 2.12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have al always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but how much more in my absence. And then it's Paul, he says, work out your own salvation, not work on. It says work out. And we know this has to do with your walk rather than your, your uh, justification. But the next verse... For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Mm -hmm. So the only way God can work in you is by you getting the word in you. <laughs> and getting that word in you, rightly divided, is just so important. Uh, God is going to, what is, you know the verse better than I do, brother. Faithful is he who began. Who, a, who calleth you, who also will do it. Well, the one that's faithful is he who began a good work. In oh, you. began a good work. Amen. Remember um, that one, faithful. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let me get over here. I think that's so important to understand that not only did God start a good work in you, but it says, you're not going to complete it, Joel. You're not going to complete my work. Uh, Mike, you're not going to complete it. Philippians 1.6. Yeah, God Being confident God of this very it, thing yeah. that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. What a day. You know, thinking that, you know, that it's God. He's taken on the responsibility. Um, sorry, there was a... Uh, I'm just looking for that website. The... Um, all right, so I wonder if I think it's here on Vimeo. Uh, no, that's not it. Um, All right, so in any event, sorry, forgive me. Uh, uh, Karen makes the point that the, there is a documentary coming out tomorrow from Trevor Loudon, uh, website uh, by the same name, No Spaces, Enemies Within the Church. Um, uh, Church.com, I think it was. Yeah, that's it. And here, I'll just share the link. Yeah, there's some. So I think... And I saw this promoted by Protestia. Also, I think the the main guy on Protestia was one of the producers or something. But uh, the um, it's a documentary about you know all this satanic stuff that's come into the church now, basically, uh, uh, particularly um, extremist, wokest stuff 
Um, it probably will have a Calvinist bent to it. Uh, but I, I would totally watch that documentary, and it's on. Uh, that is also on my to-do list. So we'll see how that we'll see how that goes. Uh, the trailer looks great. So I shared the link, and you can see the the trailer to that documentary. Um, Karen says about wokeness infiltrating and changing the gospel. Right, changes wow. actually yeah. destroys everything That's it. that is spiritual and yeah. holy. Destroys everything. Mm -hmm. Politicizes everything. Um, Valerie says most people just want to be right without discussion. We've lost yep. the ability for a civil discourse of having two opposing opinions and, and being civil about discussing those differences. Um, uh, Jones asks Joel, um, the, uh, are you familiar with Paul Jacobs? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, uh, Seems maybe like I've heard that name. I, I don't. But. I don't. I'm, I'll go with no. I'm not sure. I don't. Yeah, I don't think I, don't. I am. Um, the uh, Karen says there's okay. So Jake says uh, Valerie uh, Proverbs fifteen ten correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that yeah. hateth reproof shall die. Right, right. Well, um, you know, you know where a lot of division uh, in the in the church uh, has been is people that have been saved. And they get together for a Bible study, and all of a sudden you got, say, 20 people, 50 people, and they're all bringing a Bible. But unfortunately, they're using 20 different Bibles. Right. And all of a sudden, you start asking opinions and everything, and Joel says one thing about uh, a certain verse and I go to Joel Joel that's not what my Bible says right you know my Bible doesn't read that way right. how can you then put your authority on the Word of God right you know so uh, the division I mean this is Satan loves what's going on in the body of Christ I mean he sees that division he doesn't see Ephesians chapter 4 the 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 unity uh, the sevenfold unity mm -hmm. of the church uh, we can agree on what maybe three, four points, maybe. Right, right. Um, and that's about it. Sandra Briggs uh, asks if Trevor allowed a right divider Pauline doctrine. No, I don't think it. I doubt it. I think most of the producers here are probably Calvinist, uh, but sometimes they they might have some. I mean, I don't know if there's anything that they will be able to ha say in the documentary that most of us don't already know. Um, uh, we've already seen a lot of. Yeah, a lot of people have already seen a lot of wokeness and heresy and issues in uh, churches outside of uh, grace. Um, it's just something we've observed, uh, but we've not had any issues within grace, thankfully. Um, let me see here. Jake, uh, Jake quotes 2 Timothy 3.16, uh, all scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. He has correction in caps here. And for instruction in righteousness. Well, uh, that's exactly what the word is for, certainly, um, without a doubt. All right, now let me see what else we got here. Um, got another verse from Jake on, uh, oh, look, um, on Romans 12.3. Uh, every, uh, that to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. Yep, exactly. What a great reminder. I love that. Uh, pride is the wall. Um, absolutely. Um, Dan says, I feel so sad about those uh, Southern Baptist Convention. They're so close to the truth, but still think that they have to get uh, baptized for salvation. I've not heard that, uh, that, that Baptists have gone to, the, the, to this extreme where you have to be baptized for salvation. That's not, wasn't there terribly typical. Uh, if, if there are, it wouldn't surprise me that there are now elements of the Southern Baptist Convention, or Southern Baptists who, who, would, who might believe that. That wouldn't shock me at all. There's nothing that shocks me anymore. Um, the uh, Baptists that we have, rather popular ones in uh, local, um, in Central Florida, um, you know, every once in a while I'll hear them on the radio uh, preaching, and, um, and then you get to the end and they give the gospel, and it's just like, what, what did I just hear? That's 
I, you know, you can't even, I, I'm, uh, with many, I'm not, I don't, I don't want to speak broadly and paint with a broad brush, but with many, it's like you can't even get a clear gospel out of them anymore. It's all this Lord of your life and ask him to come into your heart nonsense. Dude, dead, buried, risen, risen as a payment for your sins. How they lost the way when it comes to just the basic gospel is just amazing. Um, Chris Nelson said, this is great stuff, Mike and Joel, and uh, getting one another started. Well, we're trying. We're <laughs> um, Valerie says, yep, Mike, and it doesn't say the good news either. Karen, uh, let me see. Uh, David Reed uh, this morning. Uh, David, I have a video, a link to a David Reed message uh, that looks like a good one. Uh, it looks like Stephanie posted an older uh, message from a conference that he did in 2019. And the name of it is The Time of Gentile Grace. I am all for promoting my dear brother David Reed. Um, so let's see here. We've got... Uh, Abraham was different. He had faith before the law. Abraham begins with faith and Christ ends with faith. Uh, first and last are the same. Thank you for that. Uh, Dan says, yep, Abraham was a Gentile and was given a promise. That's right. Abraham wasn't circumcised, Valerie says. Yep. Um, uh, K says, uh, K. Dico quotes Second Thessalonians 2.14, whereunto he called you by our gospel. To the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. I love that verse. You're called by Paul's gospel. You know, the, the calling. God calls you. The, the gospel is the means by which God calls you. The calling is just an expression of God's will for you. And he calls you by the gospel. That's how he calls you. And it's an expression of his will that he wants you to do what? Not just, not only except, you know, Christ is your Savior, except his death, burial, and resurrection is a payment for your sins. But what does that verse say? That Second Thessalonians 2.14 says that he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's, that verse is saying that the Father is calling you because I want you to have my Son's glory. Is that not amazing? Is that not amazing? The, can you just imagine the Father saying, Come by faith and accept what my son accomplished for you at Calvary because I want you to have his glory. That's amazing. I love that verse. You have uh, Acts 10.36, uh, the word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. Um, uh, wonderful comments. You guys are just on fire. I think we, I think we lit, the, lit the live chat up with uh, all these um, wonderful thoughts. Um, Yeah, Dan says only YouTube knows how bad it really is, eh? That's right, that's right. Um, Jake says, Joel, my dad is progressing in the knowledge of the truth. Thank you so much for your prayers, good. He is becoming hungry for the word truth. He is really enjoying our weekly Bible study, which is up to 11. Fantastic, 11 people now, sorry. It's wonderful, praise the Lord, fantastic. Fantastic. That is, that is awesome to hear. Um, now, make sure your father, under, make sure he understands identification. You, you, I'm sure you probably were all, all over that like, <laughs> like crazy, but you got to make sure. The hook, you want to really get him hooked. You want to keep him in the, great, in the knowledge of the truth. Identification was designed to be that hook. You've got to make sure you bring newbies into the understanding of identification. Um, and I'm telling you, it works. I'm, there, there are people who we've seen who are just like, uh, you know, dragged here by their spouses. And they're just like, what is this? And, you know, but then when they understood identification, then they got hooked. I've seen that more than once. And uh, identification is the thing. That's the thing none of the other denominations teach. You know, of course, you, have to, you can't arrive at a identification without also being within the framework of right division. But right division isn't the end of wisdom. Right division is the beginning of wisdom. And it's the key that opens the door. And when you open that door and go inside, what do you find? Identification. Dead, buried, risen with him. 
the old you gone. You are now a new creature. Behold all things new. And you are literally freed from the power and the bondage of sin. You got to reckon that truth a reality in your life. You have to live your life in light of that truth. You got to live your life like the saint God made you in his son. So life is just simply <laughs> aligning your earthly walk with your heavenly identity after that, you know? Um, so I, you're probably all over it. I, your father is in great hands with you, brother. Uh, but um, I just uh, I just had to say that. <laughs> now let me see here. Uh, uh, Jake says, it's so awesome to see my dad get saved in 74 years after a lifetime of not believing. Praise the Lord. Amen. Wow. It's never Praise too the late. Lord. Never too late. Um, <laughs> Dan is tempting me to say a word that's spelled T-R-E-A-T, uh, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> would, he, would Kyler go nuts if he heard that? Yeah, he, I don't think he would. Uh, Dan said uh, He's that is... a smart is, dog, but I don't think... <laughs> Uh, Dan said, that is so awesome, Jake. I don't think my dad would ever come to the truth. He died a devoted, a, a devout Catholic. Um, uh, still working on, uh, Lori says, I still working on to encourage Joyce to open the Bible and read in Romans for a start. That's awesome. Yeah. Keep I at it. Keep at agree it. more. Keep at it. Uh, Maria says, praise the Lord, Jake. We can always trust in our wonderful Lord. Amen. So will you do that today, Maria? Will you trust the Lord as your Savior? Will you please? <laughs> you plant another seed, aren't you, brother? <laughs> you know, God's, I, I, I truly believe God is going to give the increase with Maria. I have no yeah. doubts. Um, uh, I see your comment here, Kay, about your father. I'm so sorry. I truly am. Yeah. Uh, Jake says... Um, uh, he felt uh, bad about hearing the... Uh, news about Dan's dad and dying a devout, a devout Catholic. Maybe he says maybe sometime in this in his life he trusted that Jesus died for his sins, and you'll yeah. be pleasantly surprised. That's the thing. Yeah, that's the thing, and I that's that's a point I often make uh, to people, especially to the Catholics. Is it possible that over the course of their lives uh, they stumbled across the gospel, they heard something, and they believed? It is possible. Not in, yeah. not within the Catholic Church, but you know, there's a general openness to Christianity, Christian thoughts. Uh, so you know, and you don't know what someone was thinking and feeling and believing every second of every moment of their life. Amen. And you just have to wait and see for the most part, and hope for the best uh, when it comes to somebody who has not given you a solid profession of faith uh and you know if somebody gives you a profession of faith you just have to take take their word and yeah. it, that they are that they mean what they're telling you but yeah. you know you don't know what somebody is thinking you know mm -hmm. do you know if somebody as a child may have seen something on tv and said or heard something on the radio say i believe that absolutely yeah you just don't know yeah you just and, don't know and and don't ever fall in the trap when you're talking with a catholic who is really grounded in all the traditions and they've elevated Mary to right. the position. But don't fall into that trap where they assume and start asking you, are you telling me right. that I don't, if I don't believe the way that you believe that I'm going to hell or right. you, are you telling me that my grandfather or my grandmother or you know someone in their past that didn't ever hear Paul's gospel. Right. Are you telling me they went to hell? Right. And don't, man, don't ever take that position of right. saying, well, and, and since so many uh, that have, you know, been right dividers, but have not been very gracious. Right. And uh, have just pretty much assumed that if you didn't believe Paul's gospel, then you're going to hell. Right. And I love what Joel just said. Mm. I mean, I used to watch the movies, you know, back when I used to watch the Ten Commandments and, and some of those movies, and I would watch I them cru crucifying the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I believed everything of that, that he was real, and Catholicism right. teaches you. I mean, it's no different than when I went, and Brother Dan will probably tell you, there was never a doubt that you believed that there was God and that his son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, and, 
you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and you believe he died for the sins of the world. Right. But you never appropriated and said, you know what? I'm included in that. He died for me, for my sins, and I trust that. And that's all it would have taken is a nanosecond of a Catholic to watch that and appropriate that and say, gosh, he went on the cross to die for my sins. Right, right. I believe that. Right. I mean, you just can't assume that Catholics are saved. You have to assume they're not and make yeah. sure you walk them to the gospel. But yeah, Exactly. Uh, Dan says, yep, Joel, we give them the gospel and they run. Um, Chris Nelson, that is awesome, Jake. Praise the Lord. Um, all right. Uh, Jones says, I used to easily blown to and fro by every wind of doctrine right division has now enabled me to recognize heresy as soon as i hear it amen isn't that a huge relief Ooh. i mean that is one of the great yeah. great sources of joy about right division you yeah. know heresy when you hear it that's that spiritual antenna man he that, said that goes up Joan says know. praise yeah. god the father and the lord jesus christ isn't Amen. that fantastic yeah and you know isn't it just fantastic to know that the good news the truth is actually better news than what churches will tell you and the truth is that you know you're not you're not saved by how you live. You live by how you're saved. I love it's not that. about you doing good works in order to earn God's, God's acceptance. This is about your acceptance of that perfect work his son did for you at Calvary. Amen. And, and that's it. Once you accept him, accept by faith, not just who he is, but what he accomplished for you. And the father gives you that free gift of eternal life. You are, in, he will, Amen. you are not, you, you're dead, buried and risen. You're sealed by the spirit bone of his bone flesh of his flesh you are so one with him there is nothing or anything or anyone that could ever uh, undo what Christ did for you or what God the Father did for you with what he made you in his son that moment you believe you you you, you are his forever amen it's amazing yeah um, so all that all these denominations and a lot of that nonsense they're teaching it's once you see, once you see the truth, it's you know yeah. you can't unsee it. That's it's it. um you, you can't you know all yeah. the lies just became that much more obvious. Um, so I know that feeling well. Yeah, I know man. that feeling really well, and I I absolutely celebrate with you totally. Um, amen. Uh, Joan says, Amen. Uh, uh, friends, such a blessing to have confidence in every word of Scripture. Exactly. Amen. Does it not? Once you understand the, uh, you know, once you have br been given clarity about the distinct, about the contradictions in Scripture and so many of the things that trouble so many people and denominations today, once you, once you see it, does it not give you that much more confidence in His Word? Because amen. it is actually perfect the problem are the, these people who have just not come to recognize the truth or they're unwilling to acknowledge what is obvious in your king james bible yeah um so yeah it's just it's just amazing um and i'm right there with you it's still you know the even the basics of right division doesn't get old for me uh the gospel doesn't get old but the thing that lights my fire is just identification yeah yeah, um, you know, and those people, it's just like the unsaved that are out there. They walk differently than we we do. Than when we when we rightly divide the scripture, we they walk body, soul, and spirit. Right. And we walk just the opposite. We right. walk spirit, soul, and then the body. And so it's just a, a, a totally. I love that it, point. Yeah, it's just totally opposite of. of of each other so. gerard says uh we got gerard in the house my dear brother from uh amen from the netherlands huga that's what okay. i have for you that's the word i got for you huga i love i love that word Yuga. uh gerard says tell row row and all my other brethren and sisters grace to y'all and peace from god the father and our lord jesus christ our savior amen. dude i hope you're doing great great greeting um amen. well case says um uh Grace, peace, big tight hugs, and much love. Right back at you. Amen. Right back at you. Um, <laughs> Dan says, Mike, you forgot your bathroom, Mike. Oh, brother. when I left? Uh, the time you went to the bathroom well, with your mic? I went to the bathroom, but it was Kyler that used the bathroom. Oh, so, is that what it so was? We were outdoors. 
he's relieved and he's now resting. So we have um, we have Lourdes in the house. She says, hi, everyone. Grace and, oh, and peace Lord. to all. I'm strengthened in the Lord in this sad moment of my life. I have today Ooh. my daughter, Ivana, that's working remote and being a, a company to uh, and accompanying me. I think she means love you all. Lourdes, I love you to death. Yeah. And uh, we will keep you and Ivana sure. and your entire family in our prayers. And we will absolutely mention you. She, um, she's going through this, you know, trial and everything. And boy, she's just doing it <laughs> with such grace. You Kay know, says, the way she's handling it. That's right. Kay says, uh, Joel, how many times does one have to plant the cedar? Um, we must be talking <laughs> about Maria. I, I don't know, man. We've got so many seeds planted with that woman. It's like, a, it's like the biggest garden in the world right now. At least it should be. But I'm hoping something will sprout. Well, maybe it's the same amount of times that you have to forgive her, Brother Joel. How many right. times does right. they tell us in, in the books of uh, right. <laughs> Matthew, Bart, Luke, and John? Jake, <laughs> Jake says, Amen, Joel. Started the Bible study uh, with how right division shows us how we are justified. Once we're justified, I explain identity in Christ. Then after our identity, I explain how we should walk. Okay, perfect. Yep. Perfect. Um, I, lo I, love that. I love that order. And, you know, I... And you, I, know, I know I'm preaching to the choir. Oh, how we should walk in that new identity, he says. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And that's why I think the, you know, there, the structure of the book of Romans is perfect. And, and the, the, the structure is one I think we should follow. He starts with the gospel. And then what's the first thing he teaches the newbie after they, after they hear the gospel in the first five chapters? The first thing he does in chapter six is teach them identification. Amen. And then you get the application of it. Um, and then you get into right division. And I think there is absolute wisdom in that structure. And I think anybody who wants to have a study or they want to do, I think, I think you've got to follow that pattern. Gospel, identification, then right division. That's the that's the yeah. that's what you do with newbies. Amen. That's that's the that's the path you go down. And uh, I I think God, you know, was brilliant in the way they do that because the the the, the, the really the greatest truth is identification, and they're going to love that truth. And then once they once they once they understand that truth, then they will. You know, they'll be keen to understanding right division because right division helps them to make sure they, you know, never lose that truth. And they understand why they know that truth. Um, so, I, I mean, it's, I, I'm very passionate about that particular point with newbies. That's the process of, of growth for newbies. Uh, they got to go down that road. That's why I wrote the book. <laughs> so, sorry, don't get, don't get me started on that. Amen. Um, all right, so Gerard says, um, uh, as in the days of Noah, just thinking that when the flood occurred, that we also had a pole shift which reversed the seasons, this, thus month one and two become month seven and eight. There you go. Did you, did you know that, Mike? I did not know that. Uh, Dan says, uh, thank you. Yep, Mike, I sometimes rationalize that many more are saved than know the truth. I leave it in God's hands and trust God's decisions. I totally do. Amen. Um, Eli says, there is uh, therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, flesh but after the spirit. spirit. Right? Amen. I love that verse. And I love Amen. the controversy that that verse has, where some well, folks uh, in uh, mid-Acts dispensationalism used to use that verse and say, well, you know, that, that walk not after the flesh, mm -hmm. but after the spirit. I'm not, I'm not so sure that should be there. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make any sense no. and stuff. Uh, you know, no, it makes perfect sense. They, <laughs> it works they, just fine. They would only use that verse right. for justification. Right. You, they would never talk about the walk of right. the believer. Right. You're talking no. about, he's talking about a blameless walk, yeah. a, a walk that is above reproach. And the, the only way you can have a walk that is above reproach, that is above condemnation, that is, that is blameless, essentially, is if you're walking after the Spirit. Uh, Romans 8 is the, is the application of identification. You know, that is that is how we live in light of who we are. We walk in that spirit. And by living that way, you have a walk that's above reproach, essentially. Um, I love that point. <laughs> uh, Kay says, indeed, Gerard, my leaves on my tree have just started changing color. Normally, all leaves have fallen in October. Um, uh, Jones says, run, run, do the law demands, but give me neither feet or hands. Better news the gospel brings. It bids me fly and gives me wings. Ah, wow. 
right on <laughs> <laughs> right on man i could I love that, that. Any better uh, that was great yeah yeah i love that um all right we've got uh hey it's awesome to see uh uh we've got the uh south dakota hygienist how you doing? Thank you very wow. much for the thousand. Uh, the he says happy one thousand subs. Yeah, that's right. Hygienist. Um, weirdly enough, uh, the, the numbers keep going up and down, but it stays at at uh, ten thirty. The because uh, I'm noticing in the um, in the studio, like we have we're gaining a lot, but then we're losing a lot too. So I <laughs> so it stays at ten thirty. Uh -huh. um, how about uh, now? We'll get into maybe a little bit more. Um, a little bit more here about the Apostle Paul and his uh, um, uh, a, a proper authority as an apostle and the apostle of the Gentiles. There's one point that, uh, one other point I, I wanted to make uh, about this whole issue of people in the Southern Baptists who are basically assaulting the authority of Paul and his apostleship and his epistles because of that issue of uh, complementarianism, the idea that you know men and women, women are of equal value and equal standing in the body of Christ, but simply given different roles, which is, I agree. which is uh, you know um, uh, why the Apostle Paul would say in First Timothy two twelve that I suffer a woman not to teach. It's not God's plan that a woman were would preach behind the pulpit at a at a at a church. Or be a pastor. It just wasn't part of his design. So the only way for some people to make that verse not applicable to us is to say, "Well, Paul's not. You know, he's not. You know, it's I mean, he, Paul's just speaking for himself. It's not really. It's not. It's not really him speaking. I mean, it's not really. It's not really Jesus speaking. It's not like those are red letters. It's, you know, he's just saying that's what he does. Which means, you know, I don't have to do that, right? Mm -hmm. When when and if you start thinking that way, then you can just discount everything Paul says. Yep. You can start. You can just. You might as well just rip out all his epistles. That's it. Um, and we made the point that not only do you, must you recognize his apostleship? But you have to recognize the distinctive ministry that he had been given, which is completely different than anything that came before him. And it is completely different than the Lord's earthly ministry in the Gospels. And this is the the basics of what we call right division. It's the it's essential to understand your Bible. It is the key that helps you to understand your Bible. And we talked about uh, many different examples in the in the um, uh, in the Gospels. And here's so here's here's one about the Great Commission. Uh, you know, you you consider the fact that Peter and the twelve they were told, "Go ye therefore and teach all the nations." baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And then you have Paul saying in 1 Corinthians 1.17 that Christ sent me not to baptize. How do you explain that? Do you think Peter and the Twelve could say that? They were specifically told to baptize. Mm -hmm. You know, we mentioned earlier, I mean, we've mentioned before, uh, Matthew 3.11, you know, that in that one verse you have three different types of baptisms. You have baptism by water, spirit, and fire in that one verse, Matthew 3.11. And yet Paul says in Ephesians 4.5, there is only one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Yep. You know, does not one mean one? What, how can this one baptism that Paul's talking about not be that baptism of the Spirit that takes place the moment you believe? First Corinthians twelve thirteen. Yep. And why was it that the Lord and why was it that the Lord didn't send Paul to baptize? And Paul tells you in First Corinthians one seventeen, he says, Lest the cross of Christ be made of none effect. Any work that you add to your salvation. Any work at all, you add to your salvation. You're saying, well, it's not required for salvation, but i got to follow this water baptism thing in obedience. No, you don't. Anything you add to your salvation is an affront to the power and to the glory and to the victory and the all-sufficiency of what Christ accomplished at Calvary. And you consider the many different types of distinctions, the many different types of contradictions between what was taught in the Gospels and what Paul taught. You know, you have um, you have in the uh, Israeli program. You had in the uh, time past. You had Israelites who were 
their blessings were physical and they were conditional under the if-then principle of Deuteronomy 28. But under Paul, all our blessings are unconditional, mm -hmm. given to us that moment you believe. He said, this, God the Father has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places and made us join heirs with Christ. In the Gospels, you have in the, the great contrast here when it comes to forgiveness. In the Gospels, forgiving others was a requirement yeah. to receive forgiveness from God the Father. You remember how the Lord mm -hmm. told the disciples in Matthew six fourteen and 15. He said, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Well, how do you explain that? And when you think, and when you consider what Paul said, how Paul told us that we've already been forgiven, Ephesians four thirty two: Be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Amen. Or Colossians two thirteen, in which the in which we us being dead in our sins and the uncircumcision of our flesh. Hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses? Amen. All your sins are forgiven under Amen. Paul. How do you explain that contradiction if Paul wasn't teaching something completely different? Amen. I have a, I have a message for all those religious people that don't really want to recognize Paul or follow Paul. Go ahead and take your Bible and just take the book of Acts... <laughs> and take all 13 books that Paul wrote and rip them out of your Bible. So you're going to go from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, John, and then boom, right after John, you're going to be in the book of Hebrews. We would not even be here today. They would have been in tribulation immediately. I mean, when you just want to disregard Paul's gospel and you want to follow the kingdom gospel, and instead of being spiritual, you want to physicalize everything. You don't want to, you know, we, we talk about people having uh, spirit, spiritual eyes. They don't have spiritual eyes because they tell spiritual lies. Right, they tell spiritual lies because they don't have they don't spiritual have eyes. Because they don't. Because, and, and, yeah. They spiritualize. So they spiritualize. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah, I would just say to those people, just rip those books out, you know, go ahead and take, <laughs> take Acts out and go ahead yeah. and then see how you're doing. I mean, you tell me where you're at in the tribulation. Do you see people right now right. Uh, walking around with the mark of the beast? Do right. you see the Antichrist? You don't see the Antichrist because he hasn't surfaced yet. Right. Um, so, you know, I, I just I go back to just maybe the simplicity of right. understanding uh, that Paul had, <laughs> Paul is our apostle, and just as back in time past, uh, the nation Israel followed Moses, uh, he was the lawgiver, but right. it was actually God that was the lawgiver, and now Paul is the grace giver, but guess what? It's actually God who is giving Paul the grace, right? So it comes from God, exactly. So, you know, boom. Go ahead, brother. So, I'm sorry. No, yeah, it was awesome. I love that. Yeah. yeah. So you know, you consider the, the con some of the contradictions we mentioned. The forgiveness being a big one. I love that one. How do you how do you explain those contradictions? And you know, the, I would just beg you to consider if you're new to this uh, channel, you're new to the Grace Life podcast. I beg you to consider this fact that Paul is our apostle for today. That's how you explain those contradictions. Mm -hmm. You know, you consider the fact that, or just prayerfully consider Amen. that what that what the Lord revealed to us through Paul was entirely different than what had been taught before him, and and that explains why Paul three times talks about my gospel. Amen. You know, Romans two sixteen, sixteen twenty five, Second uh, Timothy two eight. You know, that's why he talks about my gospel because his good news. The good news that he was giving people was completely different, different than the good news of the kingdom that was being given to Israel. It's two completely different programs. This is why Paul, three times under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, tells us to be ye followers of me. 
I mean, how do you explain that? There's only there's really only been two explanations. You either acknowledge what's obvious that Paul was teaching something completely different. It's a completely different program, and we need to be followers of him because in his writings alone, we find the destiny of the church today, the body of Christ. Or you just sort of write Paul off as some sort of egomaniac, some sort of nut job, you know, and then you just discount everything he teaches. There's no middle ground there. But you have to accept the, the reason he says to be followers of me three times. You have 1 Corinthians 4.16, 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, and then you have Philippians 3.17. And the reason he says that is because he is our apostle for today. Amen. And because Paul's conversion by grace on that road to Damascus was to be a pattern to all who should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting, 1 Timothy 1.16. Amen. If he's teaching the same program as what everybody else was teaching before him, then why was his? Why would he say, "In me first, Jesus Christ, my show forth all long suffering," as a pattern to them that should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting? Why does? Why is? Why would he in him first? He would be a pattern to us when it comes to salvation by grace through faith. I mean, if if this is if it's all the same program, why is he first? Amen. It makes no sense. He's a pattern because we are in a new dispensation of the grace of God, Ephesians 3, 2. And inter- it's an interruption of the prophetic program in which God's now just simply, he's dispensing grace to all. His grace reigns today. He's Amen. dispensing grace to everybody, Jew and Gentile alike. Everybody who comes to him by faith, trusting in that death, burial, and resurrection of Christ as a complete and total payment for all our sins. God revealed all of this to Paul in what the, what he calls a mystery, which hath been hid from ages and generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. This is why, 2 Timothy 2.15, that's why we are to rightly divide the word of truth. Amen. And you have in the majority text manuscripts, which is the written word of God, rightly dividing, was accurately translated in the King James Bible from the Greek or the Demeo, which means to dissect correctly or to make a straight cut or to rightly divide. We must make a straight cut in the Bible between what is spoken to us and what isn't, between God's kingdom program for Israel and God's grace program for us today, between prophecy and mystery, between Israel and the church today, the body of Christ. Amen, brother. You couldn't have said it better. <laughs> I, I just wanted to know why uh, is be diligent and rightly divide, do they have two different meanings? Be diligent? <laughs> That's what a lot of the, the NIVs uh, oh. will say, be diligent. Oh, yeah. Or uh, handle accurately. You handle accurately. Yeah, I've, heard, yeah. I've heard the handle accurately Rather than things. Rather study right. to show thyself approved. Is that different than study? Well, the handle accurately is yeah. uh, probably an accurate translation of a bad text. Yeah. Is, is what that boils down to. Yeah. Um, um, so, the... Uh, uh, I so I just I'll leave that case in your hands. There was um, let me see here. Let me see what we got in the live chat. Um, case says Paul was a was just a man that killed anybody that loved Jesus. That's right, and he tortured them too. Yeah, that made I, sense that God yeah. would choose Paul to preach the dispensation of the grace of God. Praise be to God. Yeah, right? totally. You know, Paul's the only one, when you think about it, I didn't hear anywhere in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John where any of them said how bad they, how bad a sinner they were or anything like that. Right. You didn't hear that, you know? Right, and, right. And all you hear about Paul is how he's the chief of sinners. Right. And guess what? Right. I can identify with that, yeah, the I, chief totally. of sinners. He was saying, yeah, boy, I needed, I needed a savior. He admitted he was. So, you know, you look at that. And so when we look at Paul, I mean, anybody that thinks that Paul put himself on a pedestal, um, I'm telling you, if, you, if that's what your thoughts are, uh, you're actually probably uh, thinking about that in, more in the flesh than you are in the spirit. Right. Um, boy, Paul, what, what, a, what a person to follow. But he always said, you know, follow me as I follow Christ, you know. 
Uh, I, you so. know, and I, I mean, I'm struck by the thought of what Paul says of himself there about being, you know, what, what he says of himself, he says for all, he speaks for all of us. Yeah. You know, we can also celebrate as Paul celebrates because we're all recipients of that same grace. You know, we've, we've all been counted faithful. Um, to receive that gift of eternal eternal life. You know, we've all been put into the ministry. We're all ambassadors for Christ. And now, mm -hmm. and we've all now been entrusted with that ministry of reconciliation to a lost and dying world. And that same grace that saved us is the, the same grace that brought us into the knowledge of this beautiful truth. And which, which was committed to Paul, you know. And we're, we can't become vain or proud about knowing these truths are being lucky enough to have come into these grace truths, but we just share with Paul those same feelings of mm -hmm. awe and gratitude and yeah. praise for what Christ has accomplished for us, in us, and through us yeah. by his exceeding abundant grace, you know? Yeah, we take the opposite attitude that uh, a Calvinist would take, uh, how they, lift, they put themselves on a pedestal. Right. And, we right. we 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 are to be the opposite of that, you know. How fortunate and blessed, and and <coughs> oh, I mean, you think about it. I mean, I know for a fact, had I not heard Paul's gospel and placed my trust in it, I know if I died, I right. know where I would spend eternity, right. and I would have been deserving of going into the lake of fire. For everything we are and for everything we have, it's God himself to be praised endlessly for, for his exceeding abundant grace. Amen. You know, that's yeah. the, the same exceeding abundant grace of God that surpassed all our sins, you know, that ultimately identified us with his son in that death, burial, and resurrection, that same exceeding abundant grace that crucified the old man that freed us all from sin's dominion and the condemnation of sin, the exceeding abundant grace that transformed us into new creatures mm -hmm. <laughs> and made all things new. Mm -hmm. I think he's yeah. resting his head on my foot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that same exceeding abundant grace that gave us a newness of life, that newness of life that, w that we should live. It's a spiritual life that exists in us that's as fresh and new for all eternity as it was that moment we believed. We are given the newness of life and the exceeding abundant grace that blessed us with all spiritual blessings, made us sealed by the Spirit, one with Christ, heirs of God, seated in the heavenly places. Um, and you have this exceeding abundant grace that would mm. use the weak things of us to make known to the world the riches of his glory and the depths of his love and the, the, the salvation he offers to everyone as a free gift. Amen. Yeah, you know, I was going to say, brother, the only good news about being, when I, you know, people called me a sinner before, but when I realized I was a sinner, the only good news <laughs> was that I qualified for the free gift. That's right. You know, that's hey, right. The only way I could get that free gift is that right. I qualified. Not only was I born with a sin nature, but when I knew uh, the difference between right and wrong and what to do and what not to do, I chose to do the wrong thing. So I kind of had to, I was in double jeopardy there, brother. I mean, <laughs> you know, so I qualified and I praise the Lord. That he, I know we not time to give the gospel no, right now, but you know, I just praise. Go ahead. No, I just praise the Lord that you know, being growing up in Catholicism, as Dan can identify with this and many others, that I, there was never a doubt that there was a God and that there was a, a person by the name of Jesus Christ who was the Son of God, and uh, there was the Holy Spirit. And I went to catechism, you know, basically five days a week and then church on Sunday. So I had religion uh, shoved in my face, which I had no choice in. I always talk about two things I never asked for. Number one, I never asked to be born. Uh, and I think everybody will uh, agree with that. And then number two, I never asked to be imperfect. Uh, I, I wasn't perfect. And I think everybody out there would say, you know what, I, I'm not perfect either. So that's why 
I love the message of grace because it does not discriminate against anybody. Mm. You know, salvation is unto all and upon all them that believe. So in growing up through Catholicism, I, I just always believed that Jesus Christ, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that I would watch movies about his crucifixion. And I would literally cry as mm. a young boy and as a man. But I never really truly understood that what he was doing was not only was he paying for the sins of the world, but he was dying for me. And uh, once I, I got a little bit older and uh, I just... Uh, I, I went searching. It, it was that void that was placed in my heart before I was even born by God himself. And all he wanted me to, to, to do was to fill that void. And that void that was missing out of my life was his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. And that's that, you know, many people fill that deep, dark hole with many different things. And mo most of those things that they fill that deep, dark hole with have to go with pleasing the flesh. And so uh, God knew what I needed. And uh, I just praise the Lord that through all that religion I was brought up with. And then, uh, you know, when I got to where uh, I got a little bit older and I started searching uh, to find some answers that if there really is a God, where is he? And, you know, I really do need him in my life if he's really real. And God, if you're really there, please hit me over the head with a two by four so I know that you're there. You know, show me a sign, you know, sort of like Israel. Show me a sign, God, that you're real. And so thank God, you know, uh, what happened was um, I was going to... Uh, of all things, a denominational church, a Southern Baptist church. But I never heard the clear gospel message. I never heard for the wage. I may have heard for the wages of sin is death, but I never heard enough preaching on, but the gift of God is eternal life. So going back to what I was saying earlier, that if there were two things that we never asked for, which is we never asked to be born and we never asked to be imperfect. So we're born with a sin nature. And if God says, in order for you to get to heaven, Mike or Joel or anybody else that's listening, you have to be perfect. My response back then to God would be, God, then no one's going to heaven. And I can see God the Father right now. And I think about that. Saying that to him. And him looking at me and saying, Michael, you need to know something. I loved you so much. And I love Joel and I love all the people listening. I love all the people in the world that I loved you so much that I had a plan for you before you were even born. I sent my son to die on the cross to pay for your sins and to pay for everything that's wrong that was wrong with you and in order to make you perfect and in order to make you righteous and in order for me to accept you as my son just the same way I accept and my son Jesus Christ and all you have to do Mike in childlike faith is just simply place your trust and believe what I'm telling you. I can see God telling, you know, I had visions of that. God telling me, Michael, this is how much I loved you. When I was reading scripture, I, I saw that, you know, in scripture where he loved me so much that even when I was an enemy, when I was without hope and he, he sent his son to die for me so I could have eternal life. And so I, in childlike faith, just believed that, what God told me. It's not what a man told me. It's what God told me he did for me. And so by faith, I believed him. And the moment I did that, I knew I wasn't hit by a two by four. But I tell you, I had the peace that passeth all understanding and just rejoiced in my new heavenly relationship I had not only with God the Father, with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and with the Holy Spirit. And I hope 
any of you that haven't placed your trust and faith in that, I would beg you and urge you and in any way Amen. just to believe that and trust that in Jesus' name. That Amen. was awesome. <laughs> Uh, Maria says, thank you, Brother Mike, for sharing your experience with our Lord, with us. Love you, brother. Amen, sister. She's very, she's very, she's very clear that she loves you. Yeah. Yeah. That may that, be, that, uh, she may have just placed her faith in trust. <laughs> that may be I'll why, believe it when I see it. When um, she has, she's going to call you. You're, she's going to use your name first, um, and you'll know it. How about a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, how grateful we are to have Mike. And Kyler, Amen. Kai Kai, um, truly great. What a phenomenal um, gospel presentation. And Father, we're just so grateful. We're grateful to you for everything that you have extended to us, everything you've done for us, the, the provision that you made to save us from ourselves by allowing your son to die on that cross as a payment for all our sins, which Mike so beautifully explained. And everything you made us in his son, in your son, that moment we believed. We're so grateful for all of that. We're so grateful for, for, you know, um, uh, the uh, just the riches, the exceeding abundant riches of your grace. And we think of a number of people uh, this morning. We think first of all of of Lourdes and her family who are going through a very a heartbreaking moment, a heartbreaking period here. That, um, and I lift all of them up, the entire family, Lourdes, Ivana, everybody. Um, I just, um, we lift up a number of other folks. We think of a lot of people who have come and gone in this podcast. I still think of Mark 836. Um, we think of the Sunir family. We think of um, uh, Pam and Jerry and uh, all of the requests that they have, General Lee and Betty, um, uh, Larry and his daughter Wendy, uh, the entire Lightfritz family, Lori Loves Green. Jana, Butch, Joanne, Christy, all the, the whole gang. I love them all. I lift them all up here. Um, we think too of uh, Inga's daughter. Uh, we think of um, Mike Temple. Um, and we think of Mary Poulos, mm-hmm. Sam Gerhardt, Sonia and Brian, and their entire family. Lori Howell, Marie Anderson, Jake and Suzanne, and especially Jake's dad. That he will continue to grow. And he will just find that joy. I find that joy that we know that you want him to feel about everything you accomplished for him, and accomplished and made him in your son. In your son, um, we think of um, Neil Maranatha, whom we love. Totally lift him up and his entire family. The unspoken request that I have: uh, Rodney B, Douglas Graham, uh, Bob Picard, Roger and Kate, Darone, News Unit, uh, Greg and Delilah, um, Robin Scott. Uh, we think of Karen. We totally lift up her and her stepdad and her mother. Um, we think, too, also of her brother, Doug. Um, and, and the entire family, Karen herself. I just pray that in these circumstances, there will be opportunities for ministry and spiritual growth. Um, Cliff Matthews and his family, Justin Cox, Mary Beth, Betty Joe, Dan the Man, Oral Carter, Anita, um, it may have been possible, I've not gotten word yet, that Arturo may have passed away. Hmm. Um, um, but, so I just lift up John and Anita and the entire family. Um, and I am so thankful to hear news that he was a believer. Amen. So glad he's home with you. Uh, Sherry Now, Dave and Nancy Perry, Jay and Lisa Montero, Debbie Bridges, Fred and Gwen, Hal and Marilyn, Deborah D., uh, Mike and Renee Donahue, whom we love. Uh, Chris Nelson, Frank Ledoux, Maria in Colorado, uh, Randy and Ellen and their son Peter, who's really struggling with the cancer. Um, uh, Bobby Wilson, whom we love. Um, uh, Mike Moriarty, his son, who got burned. And we also pray for uh, ministry opportunities that Mike has with his entire family. Um, Jeff Ashley, our uh, former grace mate, and his ex-wife, who has ovarian cancer. Mm. Uh, Amy Stewart, Opportunities for Ministry, Allison Craig Cooley, uh, all of those requests, uh, Brad and Shay, Brad Klein and Shay, um, Opportunities for Ministry there with the family, Bev Johnson, George and Sue Ann Fitzpatrick, uh, Blake Donaldson, everybody under the sun, everybody I know, Father, I lift <laughs> them all up, everybody Amen. who's 
uh, in the live chat, the subscriber to the channel, member of the church, everybody, <laughs> everybody that is associated with us in one way or another. Amen. I totally lift them all up. Um, we love you so very much. We're so grateful for everything. And in, in these circumstances, I certainly hope that people will appropriate that power that is within them so that they can do exceeding abundantly above all that they can ask or think through that power that's in them that your peace which passes understanding will keep all their hearts and minds through your son um that you know in these difficult circumstances the lost will see in all of us your love and your grace in action and that they may all come to a saving faith in your son's shed blood on the cross at Calvary. And that the glory of your grace will be manifest in all of us. And that your grace will shine in us. And we can be able to share with others the light of the knowledge of your glory in the face of your son. We love you so very much. We are so endlessly grateful for everything, everything we are and everything we have in Christ. And I just pray that everything we say and do will be to the honor and glory of your son who died for us. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Will you do just a thought for the day, brother? I know when we're talking about witnessing to people where we talk about we don't want confrontation, we want carefrontation. Oh, and it's less, Shay. Less, Shay said something Less last divisiveness, night. more uh, delightfulness. Say that one more time. Less divisiveness, more delightfulness. Amen. That's what she said last night. Thought yeah. for the day. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Um, all right, guys. Hey, we'll be back here at 10 o'clock tomorrow. Open chat Friday. Um, get, to, get, get some good, get some good tough Bible questions, man. And we'll stump, see if we can stump the pastors, the preachers here. Um, love you guys. Do